The Great Escape The morning of the escape was one of the happiest moments of my life. I can still remember it as if it were yesterday. When the frantic guards realized that Morris and the brothers had escaped, the cheers were so loud that it could be heard for miles. I think I can speak for everyone in the cell house that morning. It remains one of the greatest moments of my life. It was a moment of freedom for all of us. James Whitey Bulger, AZ 1428 Bulger remembers. The night of the escape was exciting, but it was also unusually quiet at times. There were the typical counts at 5 o'clock, 8 o'clock, and 9.30 p.m. at lights out. Many of us knew what was in the works. There wasn't much talking between the cells of those of us in the know. Once we were locked in at 4.50 for the 5 p.m. count, the place would always change. You would not hear cell doors open or shut, only the gates when guards were entering the cell house. If you heard a cell door racked open, the whole place would be buzzing, concerned that someone was sick, being locked up in segregation, or even dead. It would have had to have been real serious if a cell door was opened after the 5 p.m. count. Any noise out of the usual would cause a reaction if you were reading, listening to the radio with the earphones, or writing a letter. It would grab you like a physical thing, and you couldn't ignore it. On B-Block, during music hour, when guys were allowed to play their musical instruments, once in a while someone with a trumpet would sound charge, and guys would bang the bed frames, hollering and laugh like mad. It would distract the guards but they heard such things often and would write it off as nuisance behavior. And many would be white guys joking with the Hispanics, because there was much of that at times. It was always good-natured, and it would go back and forth. It provided lots of background noise for months of escape work. Shortly after 9.30 p.m., lights out, it was quiet, and then we heard a loud thud on the roof, followed by the loud squawking of seagulls who lived on the cell house roof. They were startled by the sudden loud noise of the ventilator cover falling over and crashing down as the trio emerged. All of us acted out by guys hollering and creating a deafening noise that had to rattle the guards and fortunately proved to distract them. There was a real short interval between the thump and Seagull's reaction, and it worried me that the guards would react to it, because never in the history of the rock had there been such a thing heard, or ever again. Also, after years of routine counts while walking the flats in tears, the guards never dreamed of anyone being out of their cells and probably didn't process a noise coming from outside the building. If they lived on the island, the noise of the seagulls may have been routine to them. There were gulls' nests all over the island, the grounds, sides of the cliffs, building roofs, etc. Well after we made lots of noise to help divert attention, the sounds just fizzled out and the cell house came to a normal quiet. Then a long night of visualizing what it was like for the guys and sweating it out. No alarms, and the quiet meant hope. I was so excited I couldn't sleep the entire night. Every minute undetected meant one more minute ahead of the authorities. At night, guards making their rounds were very quiet. They would put felt covers on their shoes, sort of like slippers, to mask the noise of the rubber soles of their shoes. I could smell the guards when they started to count on the flats. As an example, Lewis always smelled of pipe tobacco. Others smelled of powder or aftershave or cigarettes. My sense of smell was powerful back then. The absence of motor vehicles in the fresh ocean air seemed to remove the smoke from the convicts in the cell house. Anxiety would rise as the guard's soft steps could be heard walking towards the B-block corridor. In the Alcatraz officer reports, everything was quiet and seemed normal. However, there were some indicators that in hindsight would suggest something was in the works. In Captain Bradley's report, he indicated that officers were certain the Anglins were both in their cells because they had complained that the lights in A-block directly across from their cells, was too bright, and they were unable to sleep. In a memo to Captain Bradley dated June 12, 1962, the name was redacted by the FBI, the report stated in part, 
On Tuesday night, after the 5.30 count, I passed out medicine and mail. It was mentioned at that time about a light being left on an A block across from the Anglin brothers' cell, and I said I'd see what I could do. There was excessive playing of instruments in the cell house. Young on the third tier and Banks on the B side were both warned to play more quietly or their instruments would be taken away from them. The lieutenant walked with me to the east end. I got the key from Mr. Gronzo and shut off the light across from their cell. I feel I made a complete count and they were there when I made my 9.30 p.m. count, which was started at about 9.05. In the past two weeks since I have been in the cell house, every time I make my count, the two Anglins are always whispering. Also, two other inmates on C-1 are always whispering when I make my rounds. That is the way it was last night. Other officers, even in hindsight, were completely unaware of what was about to transpire. Correctional Officer Charles H. Herman, Jr. worked the 4 p.m. to 12 a.m. shift and was relieved by Lawrence T. Bartlett, who worked the midnight to 8 a.m. watch. Herman later stated that his last count was at 9.30 p.m. and that he made no other counts during his shift. Bartlett signed the count slip at shift change and turned it into the control center. Both men would later be subject to scrutiny for their complacency, as later determined by prison officials. From Alan West's official FBI statement, Monday night, June 11, 1962, Morris had told me that we still had to complete taking the top off of the ventilator to the roof and to separate the bars. In addition, he indicated that there was little work left to complete the raft. Frank Morris said that the Anglins were talking about completing the work and breaking out that night. Clarence Anglin and Frank Morris left their cells and went up the utility corridor to the roof about 7 p.m. on June 11, 1962. Morris came down at about 8.45 p.m. that evening and said the bars were out of the hole on the roof and I gave him some water as he was thirsty. My vent to the utility corridor was not quite completed since my job was making the life preservers and this did not call for me to leave my cell. Also, if I had completed mine, it would have been necessary to make the false rear to prevent detection. John Anglin had cemented up a portion of mine to the rear where I had cracked the side of the cement to the utility corridor so no one would notice it. In addition, while working in my cell, I helped make the paddles we intended to use. I made four paddles. They were plywood, 12 inch by 8 inch and with a wooden handle. I put about two or three bolts through the paddle and handle to hold them together. These paddles were stored up on top of the cell block and inside the ventilator pipe. Morris indicated that we could go that evening if we got the lid off of the top of the ventilator. He said that the bars below it were out of the way, and he felt they would get that off by 9.30 p.m. He left and went up to the roof. Shortly thereafter, I heard some noises, and I started making noise to cover it up so no one would notice it. At 9.22 p.m. that date, Clarence Anglin tapped on my ventilator and said that they could see the moon. I tried to kick the rest of the cement out of the hole at the back of my cell. I could not do it. He tried to help for a minute or so, but couldn't do anything. He then went up and got Morris. Morris came down and put the dummy in his bed. The lights were out at 9.30 p.m., and Morris went up to the roof and got a two-inch piece of pipe and handed it to me. I tried to push it out, but couldn't do it without making too much noise. Morris left to go get Clarence Anglin to help clear out my hole. This happened at 9.37 p.m. that evening. This is the last I heard or saw of them. As there was no dummy head for my bed, I was afraid at that time to break through and leave my cell until after the 3 a.m. count. At about 1.45 a.m. of June 12, 1962, after waiting for some time for them to come back, I became anxious. I broke through my hole and went to the roof by way of utility corridor. There was no dummy for my bed when I got into this utility corridor. I noticed that they had left oink lying there, and I used this dummy head in my bed. I took my blue dungarees, undershirt, and blue pea jacket to the roof with me. I can see that they had gone since a lot of the items we had fabricated were gone. In addition, 
There had been some 100 feet of a heavy electrical cord which had been lying on the floor of the utility corridor, and I had noticed upon leaving my cell that it had disappeared. This cord was to be used in lowering our material down from the roof of the cell house, and possibly in assisting in lowering one of us down. I put my life preserver on and my pants and started to go through the hole in the roof. I had to remove my clothing before I could get through the hole. When I got on the roof, I put my clothing on again and went to the edge of the roof near the cage where the large black pipe leads to the ground. We had contemplated going down this pipe to the ground. I looked around and could not see them and figured it was too late for me to go. Also, they had taken the raft which was to be our means of escape. It is my belief that they would have been able to leave the island by 10.30 p.m. that night, or possibly no later than 11 p.m. that evening. They had planned to go through the ventilator hole on the roof and then down a large black pipe by the bakery. They had located about 125 feet of electrical cord about one-half inch thick in the utility corridor, and that was to be taken with them to assist in getting down from the roof and to lower their material. They would go over by the water tank and then down by the machine shop next to the water. They would pump the 14 by 6 feet raft made of raincoats, which had 15-inch pontoons, with the concertina that Morris had purchased. We had talked about going to Angel Island and then stick a knife in the raft so it would sink. It was believed that there would be less chance of detection if we proceeded in that direction. Upon getting to the mainland, we had decided we would commit a burglary so we could obtain guns and clothes and then steal a car. It was our desire to go as far from this area as we could, although we had no plan as to where we would go. Just the four of us were involved in the escape. To assist in this effort, I had made a periscope out of paper and mirrors which we could stick out of the hole on the roof to see if there were any guards in that area. I had given this periscope to Morris for one of the Anglins, and it was stored next to the roof. The only weapons which they would possibly have is a kitchen knife or some similar type objects which they might have sharpened. When we were working attempting to get out of our cells, we would work between 5.30 p.m. and 9.30 p.m. at night. Generally, Morris was with one of the Anglins when they went to the roof. I didn't desire that the two Anglins go there together as I didn't trust them. If we were successful in escaping, Morris and I had planned that sooner or later we would go in one direction and let the Anglin brothers go in another. Officer Freeman Pep Pepper, who had been working on Alcatraz since the 1930s, overheard West telling fellow prisoners about the escape after he had been placed in a closed front isolation cell. Freeman wrote that he had overheard the conversation from inside the treatment unit cutoff. West had been placed in closed cell number 13, and it's possible that West emptied the water from the toilet and others were listening using the same method via the plumbing network. Freeman overheard West say, Everybody better listen, because I'm only going to tell you once, and that'll be it. Is everybody on the telephone? Pepper documented what he'd overheard. He wrote in part, I started planning this when I first came out of TU. I got to looking over this vent and figured that's a good place to go out. West was in C block at this time. I talked to the Anglins first about it, and they thought it'd be a good idea. Then I moved over to B block by then, but I couldn't get right next to them, so we had to have another man in on it. The man we talked to backed out, so we got Morris in on it. We drilled in the cement for five months, and I was the first on finishing drilling. Fifty raincoats were used, except for the sleeves, to make the life rafts and life jackets. If this didn't do anything else, it ruined Alcatraz's thirty-year reputation. I went to the top of the cell block to see if I might be able to go, responding to a question as to why he didn't leave with the others, but didn't find any rope or cord to go down with, and I wasn't going into the water with just a life jacket. Morris was the first one out last night. He came by my cell, but he couldn't get me out. He said he'd get Clarence to help, but that I'd have to get it from the inside, and he passed me the pipe but never came back. That was the last I saw him. They used my accordion to pump up the raft, and I figured it'd take about an hour to pump it up. I finished the 25th of April. 
Morris was second. He finished May 11th. Clarence and Frank were feuding Sunday night on top of the block. I thought they'd get busted then with all the noise they were making. They started out last night at 8.15 and everybody was out by 9.30 but me. I got out at 1 a.m. and they were gone. I went up to the roof at 1 o'clock and ran around trying to figure out what to do. I finally gave up and went back to my cell. From the FBI Albert V. Young, correctional officer, advised that on June 11, 1962, he worked the 4 p.m. to midnight shift in the West Gallery. Young said that the West Gallery is the enclosed catwalk located at the western end of the cell block. Young advised that at about 10.30 p.m. on June 11, 1962, he heard a noise which sounded to him like a person hitting the end of an empty 50-gallon oil drum with the heel of his hand. He said the noise sounded like it came from the prison hospital. Young said he immediately reported the noise telephonically to Lt. Robert Weir. Young said he heard the same noise approximately two minutes later, and then heard it a third time approximately five minutes after that. During this time, he was on the telephone with Lt. Weir. The last time he heard this noise, it sounded like it came from the dining room cage, which is a guard post located outside the dining room wall over an alleyway leading from the cell block to the recreation yard. Young advised after reporting these incidents to Lt. Weir, he assumed that Lt. Weir checked them out. On the morning of June 12th, there was an air of excitement as the sounds of the officers started to make their final morning counts and prepare for the oncoming staff. It was a Monday morning and the start of a new work week for the convicts. William Bill Long was a lieutenant on duty the night of the escape. A native of Mifflinburg, Pennsylvania, he had arrived on Alcatraz in 1953 and was well respected by many fellow officers. His wife, Jean, was also employed on the rock as its postmaster. Long vividly remembered the morning that they had discovered the prisoners missing. I was a little late to work that night. Weir was in a hurry to get off work. There was almost no briefing from him, and he just left saying it was a routine watch. One of our regular duties before going off shift was holding a standing count. The watch going off puts in a count, and the new watch coming in puts in a count. Our counts had to correspond. I knew nothing about the big noise that was reported on the roof the night before. The hospital officer, Levinson, called in that he had heard footsteps on the roof and also a rumbling-like noise. He called back a second time and told Weir that he heard it again. Weir looked around the hospital but never went to the roof. The noise was described as a hubcap from an automobile that was tumbling around, so this certainly was no routine watch. We had a stairwell inside the cell house that gave us easy access to the rooftop. The top area was enclosed, so he could have investigated the noise by standing at the doorway and would have seen the vent cap push over. You didn't have to go up a ladder or anything like that, so it would have been real easy for him to go up and investigate that noise. He didn't, though, and just wrote it off to the wind. Ordinarily, when they count at night, the officer using the five-cell flashlight wouldn't shine the light down on the face of the inmate. You have very volatile men, and if you shine the flashlight on them during every count, they're going to be a little upset the next morning. Some of them would put the covers over their heads, and you'd take the butt of the flashlight to move the covers off. The officer doing the count would point the beam of light on the ceiling and visualize the inmate from the reflective light. One of the things they did at night was on the cell house ceiling there was a series of 25-watt light bulbs, basically night lights. And sometimes inmates using rubber bands as slingshots would shoot pebbles at them to bust them out for a little extra darkness. There was a count a little before midnight, and then around 3 a.m., 6 a.m., and then at 7 is when the day watch came in. During the night, one of the duties of the evening watch officer was to make a fire patrol. I went down into the family living area, then on to the dock to the industries building, and then back up. If these guys would have escaped along the same path and same time I made my walk, they might have been real hard on me, because there was three of them and only one of me. They could have overpowered me. 
The new watch came in, and there was about seven or eight officers. The officer in charge always sat at the desk that was right near the kitchen. The desk sort of worked as the headquarters for all the officers working in the cell house. One officer would get on each tier, and then they'd ring the bell, and the inmates would stand at the front of their cell, and when the officers finished, they'd each provide their count. It happened every day this way. On the day of the escape, the first five guys came down with their counts, three from C block and two from the upper tiers of B block. Lawrence Bartlett, the guy who was covering B1, didn't come around with the rest of them. I walked over to the edge of where I could see down the flats of the A-B corridor, and Sarge Bartlett was coming in my direction hot-footing it. And he's about twenty feet away, and he starts yelling, Bill! 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 I got a guy here who won't get up for the count! So I went up to B-150, which was John Anglin's cell. I went up to the bars, knelt down, I reached in with my left hand to tap him on the head, and it felt like it crumbled, and the head flopped onto the floor. People who were observing me said that I jumped back about four feet. That's when all hell broke loose, and the captain started ringing the bell. All of the officers came running up to the cell house. Long's official report, filed to the captain on June 14, 1962, read in part, The count started routinely, but Bartlett, who was counting B-block, rapidly came around the corner, and I could see he was excited. He said, Bill, I can't wake these two guys up. They are either dead men or dummies. I immediately accompanied him to cell B-150, and I reached into the cell and with my left hand and tapped the pillow. Things did not seem exactly normal, but until I tapped the back of the head with almost the same motion and the head fell onto the floor, I then threw off the blanket covering the supposed body, and then I reached into the next cell, B-152, where the other dummy was, and threw off the blanket. I remember at that time seeing another man in bed and went and checked the cell. It was Morris's cell, B-138. I told the officer not to touch it because, on examination, I could see that it was a dummy like the other two. I went to the phone to call the control center and dialed the captain's office. I informed Officer Martin of the dummies and was told that Lieutenant Severson was in the officer's mess. I looked into the main gate and Lieutenant Severson was coming down the stairs. I informed him that there were dummies in the beds and told the control center to call the associate and the captain. Lieutenant Severson told him to sound the alarm. We went into the cell house and opened the plumbing corridor. I immediately saw that the rear of the Anglin brothers' cells were tampered with, and then I went on to the rear of the corridor and in the checking to see if Morris's cell was the same way. I discovered that the cell next to Morris's cell was open too. This was cell number 140. I immediately came out and reported that there was another cell opened and went to check who was in that cell next to Morris. When I came to the cell, West, AZ 1335, was talking to Officer Howard Waldron. West had called him over and said, You might as well look me up too. I planned the entire escape. He was telling him how he was involved and explaining how the plan was to have worked. No shakedown could ever discover this. West was holding up a faked cardboard duplicate of the air vent and was beating it with his fist. Bulger remembered the morning the convicts were discovered missing. The night seemed to linger on forever. It felt like a year until sunrise and count time. That was the big moment, and my heart was racing with excitement. Bartlett, a guard we all called Sarge, who had retired from the U.S. Army, got to Morris's cell, and because he wasn't standing up for the count, yelled, Morris, get up! Sarge then reached into his cell and forcefully jabbed his head. Imagine his shock when it rolled off the bed and onto the floor. He leaped backwards in horror and was speechless and pointing into the cell as he tried to get words out. A guard in the gun gallery tried to get an answer as to who was missing, and Sarge yells out at the top of his lungs, Morris! Morris is gone! Well, the cell house exploded into cheers and all hell breaks loose. One by one they find the others missing. There were cheers of pure elation, joy, laughter, and jokes as the guards scrambled frantically. 
Woodrow Wilson Ganey, AZ-1520, was another convict who was later identified as a conspirator in the escape. During a mass search of cells in the days following, holes and the same methods for tunneling through the cement was found in the back of both his and June Stevens' cells. Ganey spoke with officials and admitted that both he and Stevens had originally been part of the plot. Ganey had become acquainted with John Anglin in 1958 when both of them were in the U.S. penitentiary Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. After arriving at Alcatraz on September 7, 1961, Ganey was introduced to Clarence Anglin, Morris, West, and Stevens. He revealed to the FBI some of the early dynamics of the escape plan. An FBI report included Ganey's account, along with other details constructed from various prisoner interviews. Inmate Ganey stated that he and June Hayward Stevens, Jr. were initially in on the escape plot. Ganey claims he quit after digging a few holes in his cell wall, B-348. He stated Stevens dug several holes in his cell, but stopped along with the escapees to avoid detection while the plumbing was installed, and told not to start digging again by the escapees. Eight holes were uncovered in Ganey's cell, and some 36 holes were uncovered in Stevens' cell, all carefully camouflaged. Ganey states Harold Pitts Rowe, FBI number 519052A, and Harold Wayne Davis, FBI number 394760A, both inmates acted as Stevens' lookout for about one week and then quit. He said that John Anglin, in February 1962, showed him two files which Anglin claimed he had obtained from an inmate, suspect Wilbur Markham, FBI number 3985310. At the first part of February 1962, June Hayward Stevens, Jr., an inmate of Alcatraz, having cell B-346, asked Ganey if he was interested in escaping. Stevens advised him that the Anglin brothers, Frank Morris and Alan West, all inmates residing on the first tier of B Block, were obtaining spoons and digging at the back of their cells under the sink around the ventilator. They were taking the cupped portion of the spoon off and sharpening that end of the spoon in the fashion of a screwdriver, which was then utilized in the digging. Ganey and Stevens started to dig holes in their cells. One would watch during the evening while the other one dug in his cell, and the next night the procedure would be reversed. Ganey had talked over the escape with the Anglin brothers in West while at recreation periods in the prison rec yard. They would start digging about 6.15 p.m. and would work until 9.30 p.m. when the lights were turned off. Stevens told Ganey that West worked around the cell block doing painting, and West was of the opinion that once they got through the cell walls and into the utility corridor, immediately behind it, they could proceed to the top of the cell block and break through the ventilator area and onto the roof. About the 1st of April, 1962, The Anglin brothers indicated they had completed making the holes in their cells near the ventilator area. They indicated that they had proceeded to the roof and checked the ventilator area, and they believed they could break through the lid and onto the roof. Ganey stated he dug approximately six holes in his cell in the vicinity of the ventilator. This was accomplished in about seven days of digging over a two-week period. He decided against trying to break out and told the others of his decision. As he dug out each hole, he would fill it with soap and then paint over it with cement paint so that they would be well camouflaged. When Ganey decided to quit, Stevens continued digging for about three or four weeks, and Ganey watched for him. Ganey then told Stevens he wanted nothing to do with it. Stevens then got Harold Wayne Davis, an inmate in cell B-344, to watch for him. Davis watched Stevens for about one week, and then Davis quit. Davis did not try to dig out of his cell to get out. Stevens then got Harold P. Rowe, an inmate in cell B-350, to watch for him. Rowe then watched for Stevens for about one week, and then Rowe quit. Rowe also did not try to dig any holes in his cell. After breaking through the cell walls, they had planned to put a fake cell wall and ventilator in the area which they had broken out of. They had received some instruction from the Anglin brothers on how to construct the fake cover. About March of 1962, 
The Anglin brothers and West said that they were going to build two rafts out of olive green rubberized raincoats issued to prisoners. From their conversation, Ganey believed that they were obtaining tape and paste from the tailor shop to assist in making the rafts. After the rafts were completed, it was planned to place them in the ventilator pipe on top of B block and just under the roof. The Anglin brothers told him that Morris had made a hand pump out of steel pipe, a leather type of plunger and wood which would be used to inflate the rafts. They talked of wearing long underwear which they might dye or paint black, and sweatshirts similarly dyed or painted. This would be under their regular prison clothing, which they would discard on the beach when they were ready to leave the island. They had talked about paddles out of some wood, one by eight inch board, and each was to make his own. After Stevens had dug for a few weeks, the Anglin brothers, Morris and West, had told Stevens that all of them had stopped digging since there was to be some new plumbing installed in the utility corridor of B Block. Stephen told this to Ganey and said that they were to camouflage their holes, so he dug six holes in the vicinity of the ventilator. This was accomplished in about seven days of digging over a two-week period. He decided against trying to break out and told the others of his decision. As he dug out each hole, he would fill it with soap and then paint over it with cement paint that was given to him by Stevens so that they would be well camouflaged. Stevens worked in the utility corridor upon various occasions since he was an inmate plumber, and West, who painted around the cell block area, were the ones who did the main scheming and working on breaking through the ventilator lid on the roof. During their conversations, John Anglin had indicated that it was a shorter route to go from the island to the mainland of San Francisco rather than toward Angel Island. At that time, they were considering building the rafts and going with them to the docks near where the Alcatraz prison boat docked. They would consider hiding the raft, try to locate an armory where they might steal firearms. Later, the Anglins mentioned that they might try to steal a helicopter, as Morris had read considerably in the prison library about flying, and Morris thought he would be able to pilot the aircraft. They would also steal food and clothing, if they obtained a helicopter, they would fly a considerable distance from here and thought somewhere in the California desert where they would stay for a number of months until the heat was off. If they had arrived in the desert, they had discussed stealing a big trailer truck body, digging a hole in the ground of the desert, and putting the trailer truck body down in the hole and camouflage it so that nobody could see it. They would leave it and then dig it out when no one was in the vicinity. They talked about later on getting together and robbing banks. They mentioned they would like to get their brother Al out of the Atlanta penitentiary. None of the individuals mentioned anyone that they could contact on the outside, nor did they ever ask Ganey for his acquaintances or friends, nor did he volunteer the same. Ganey indicated that since he backed out of trying to escape after initially being in on the plot, he was not in their recent escape plans, and probably Stevens was not, since they had not told him to start digging at his cell hole again. John Anglin showed Ganey two files. Anglin told Ganey that one of the inmates called Jeep, who Ganey identified as Charles Wilbur Markham, AZ 1407, stole these files from the tailor shop and gave them to John Anglin. Ganey said Markham resided on the first floor of C Block, and he still works in the tailor shop on Alcatraz. Ganey advised that Markham was not in on the plans to escape from the cells, as far as he knew. Ganey stated that he did not desire to testify in court against any one of the above individuals so long as he was at Alcatraz. To do so would mean his life, since the inmates would take care of that. He did not desire to furnish a signed statement. Stevens, Davis, and Markham all deny any knowledge or participation in the escape. Stevens was interviewed on June 19, 1962, regarding his potential role and denies all knowledge, despite the evidence proving otherwise. Stevens volunteered that he was serving a 25-year sentence imposed in September 1953 for bank robbery. He stated that he had been incarcerated in cell B346 since late fall of 1961 and at Alcatraz since 1956. He stated he never dug any holes in his cell, which includes the vicinity of the ventilator grill, nor had he tried to escape since at Alcatraz. 
He said if there were any holes in his cell in the vicinity of the ventilator grill, they must have been put there by a prior occupant. He said he was not acquainted closely with the Anglin brothers, West or Morris. He only knows Clarence by sight. He never assisted them to escape, nor has he been asked to do so. He has never heard anything relative to any of the inmates planning to escape. He is an inmate plumber and works around the cell block. However, no one has asked him for any materials which could be used in escaping. He volunteered that he heard no digging noises in the cells, nor had he heard any unusual noises on the evening of June 11, 1962. He said he had never given names of any friends, relatives, or acquaintances to the Anglin brothers, West or Morris, nor had he been asked to do so. From the FBI Trending officer L. R. Howell advised he was notified of the escape at 7.30 a.m. by the paging speaker system. He and Lt. Robert Weir, after being advised of the basic details of the escape, proceeded to the north end of the cell block to the bakery smokestack. He advised that they had noted barbed wire sagging on top of a cyclone fence located approximately 10 feet from the base of the smokestack. They then noted a strand of cut barbed wire on the catwalk outside the yard wall 50 feet from the first fence. It is in the northeast corner of the island. From this spot, he noted grass bent down near the water tower. This is about 100 feet from the last fence crossing. This bent grass area is towards the beach, and there is a 45-foot downward slope to the road level. He believed that the inmates then apparently crossed the road to the lumber and debris area to the edge of the slope leading to the beach seawall. The seawall is about four to six feet high down to the water's edge and rocks. He advised they found a one-half-inch diameter black electrical extension cord about 100 feet long rolled up in a coil near the rocks below the seawall.